Jermaine, thanks for uh, joining us on this interview. We're here to talk about, obviously, The Wire and it being re-released in uh, HD. Um, and you're a huge part of the show as well. So, I mean, I kind of wanted to ask you, before we started on, obviously, your character, the show had been on air three seasons before you came into it. Had you been watching it? Unfortunately, I wasn't watching it prior to me getting on the show because I was way too young to see anything. <laughs> I was actually 12 years old when I booked the gig. I started filming around 13, so... 11, 10, 9, I wasn't exactly watching The Wire, but... <laughs> but had you heard of it? I mean, was there anything come oh, through or...? Absolutely. It was my brother's favorite TV show, but my brother's six years older than me. You know, I had always heard about it, but I, I never tuned in. I never tuned in. I was just... I was into the Disney Channel at the time. <laughs> so how did the audition come to you then? I mean, did you go for it or what was the whole process for you? Because obviously you were quite young, as you were saying. I'm from Maryland and I was, um, you know, I was doing musical theater at the time, singing and doing plays and whatnot. So I had a management and they had told me that this audition for this show called The Wire, you know, was coming to town. And of course, that was my brother's favorite show. And I'm like, wow, HBO, that's dope. Let me go for it. And. <laughs> I went out and auditioned for, um, I initially auditioned for Michael, Michael Lee, and I was called back like three or four times for that, and then I believe on the very last day of the screen test, they hand me the script for Dookie, and I'm just like, okay, and I guess it was meant to be. Wow, okay, so that was the first time that you'd ever seen anything for, obviously, Dookie then at all. Well, not ever seen because our sides, like the, the pages really intertwine. A lot of our um, audition pieces were the same. It was just, you would be reading for Naaman, you would be reading for Michael, you'd be reading for Donut. And, um, you know, I had all, I was scared of playing Dookie. I, that was the one that I kind of shied away from because it was like, okay, be the cool, badass drug dealer or be the dirty, smelly, homeless guy. I went for Michael, but you know, hey, it was such a great opportunity. Such a great opportunity. Well, I mean, that goes into my next question is, how do you approach somebody like Duquan as a character? Well, at the time, you know, I was really not, not a child actor, but kind of, sort of. Um, I would approach it much differently these days than I would have back in the day. But back then, I was so young and I was just so innocent and my imagination was just so active. I really just allowed my imagination to really go with it. I, of course, did um, research on, you know, homeless youth. Uh, and a lot of the kids that we were acting with in the classrooms were homeless. They were the real life dookies. So I just really observed and I allowed that to just kind of come out and not try to do too much and just really be a person. Was it really to... difficult for you then? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was very... I don't think I knew how difficult it was until it was actually over. Because a lot of the... Um, a lot of the sadness, a lot of the mannerisms, a lot of, a lot of that stuck with me for a while. You know, I was just so into that character, going into the set, getting into the wardrobe, getting into the hair, you know. A lot of that stuck with me. After it was all said and done, it was it was a very, very difficult role to play. I didn't even know what I was getting myself into at the time, but, um, you know, I'm honored to have had that opportunity to take force a role like Dookie. Well, you and obviously the, the rest of the, uh, the lads from season four and five, obviously onwards, when did you first meet those? When did we first meet each other? Yeah. Was you auditioning together? So did you, you know, did you turn up and there was Mac Wilde and uh, everybody else? Well, um, that's kind of exactly how it happened. Uh, I told you, well, the day that I got there for the screen test, you know, that was my first big gig. So I wasn't really sure what a screen test was. I didn't really know. But they held the screen test at the production office in Baltimore, Maryland. And, um... You know, I get there and one of the ladies says, hey, we got some other actors from New York here. And then when I get in the room, it was Julito, it was Tristan, Mac, it was uh, Maestro. No, Maestro wasn't there, but it was just all of us. And I remember we were all kind of in the room, like, looking at each other, like, okay, am I going for your role? Are you going for my role? Like, okay, can I speak to you? And the first thing I actually remember was Tristan came across the room and he introduced himself. Hey, I'm Tristan. Nice to meet you. 
who knew all these years later <laughs> wow okay well i mean that so were you together before you went on set together then to work things out or yeah, absolutely they um they had us in school we started doing school preps at the production office and you know they allowed us to kind of build chemistry amongst one another and actually um robert chu he was our acting coach so when we had gotten season four episode one script he would meet before we shot every um before we shot every episode robert chu would work with us on our our lines together we would go in the back room at the production office and we would kind of have rehearsal and um prior to shooting the very first episode he did that with us so we had the opportunity to kind of break the ice and form a chemistry with one another at least our characters form the chemistry you know so robert chu was basically your teacher really he was. <laughs> wow. And how was he? Because obviously, I mean, he's he's fantastic in the show, but I just can't imagine him being a teacher. It oh seems so out of character. He He's actually the coolest person. You know, he's from, well, he was the coolest person, Lord rest his soul. But he was from Baltimore, Maryland. And a lot of the young kids that you see in the show, whether it's a small part in the classroom, he's their real acting teacher in Baltimore. He was very involved in the performing arts in Baltimore, and he was an acting coach for a lot of youth in Baltimore in the inner city. So he was a great acting teacher. He he was actually the one who prepped me for my screen test. I went in for David and um, David Simon and Nina Noble and did the Dookie audition, and he was like, hold on one second. Can I walk with you in the hallway for a second? So he pulled me to the side. He was like, listen, this role can be yours if you take it. And after he said that, I remember I walked in there. I was like, I'm about to take this role. <laughs> and that's what happened. He, he was such a, um, a key, a key, a, a key guy in the whole story of The Wire for all of us. He helped us all so tremendously. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, I mean, what I was going to ask was, obviously, are you still friends with the uh, with the lads? You know, with uh, Tristan and everybody. Do you see them much? Because obviously, everybody's out doing their own thing now. Yet you were such a small, tight knit unit. Oh yeah, absolutely. We see each other all the time. Well, not necessarily all the time because Maestro lives in L.A. Tristan's recording his album back and forth uh, in New York and L.A. Julito lives in New York. We see each other when we can. When we're in town, we'll hit each other up and um, we'll try to hang out. But we definitely do keep in touch. We were a part of um, what I like to consider history together. So there's a, a, a just this fraternal thing. It's like we were a part of the fr same fraternity. We may not even speak for months. But if we hit the phone, you know, pick it up. Hey, how's it going? Let's meet up. Let's do lunch. It's like we're men. We're men now. It's fun. <laughs> Uh, going away from obviously the group and just focusing on Duquan, Duke, as obviously he gets nicknamed. The first thing I wanted to speak about is the fact that he was kind of the guy who triggered the whole Chris and Snoop finding out about people putting being in, put in vacants, really. I mean, uh, were you surprised that it was Duke who was going to be that person rather than one of the police? Okay, so I was really young back then. And I, let me tell you, it's, I really wish I could go back. At the time when you're 13 and reading these great, phenomenal scripts, you don't exactly know all that's going on. I remember the most, like, we would all read the whole script, but I don't know, it was just harder for me to process at the time all that was going on, especially not um, seeing the show prior to me getting there. But I really think that that's what helped me play the character so much is that I was completely oblivious to everything but what was going on in my scenes. And I guess that helped, but um, I really loved that moment when we were all in that attic and, you know, there's no special kind of dead, there's just dead. And that was such a special moment. That's probably one of the only lines that I really remember to this day. So were you shocked about it? I mean, because when you, let's say you look back on it now, and do you think, wow, I can't believe that I was the catalyst for it really taking down one of the biggest serial killers in TV history, which is, you know, Chris Partlow. Mm -hmm. I guess I, I was shocked when I was watching it back this Christmas holiday when they did the marathon on HBO um, Signature. I guess so, I, I really got, for the first time, I got to really just be an audience viewer and just watch. And I was like, wow. And I guess that part did shock me because 
Well, it did, but it didn't because Dookie was so damn intelligent. But I just didn't think that he would be used in that kind of way to really kind of lock all the pieces together in such a way. I would have never, never, but that's David Simon for you. He has a way of just kind of orchestrating these masterpiece stories. You were talking there about Dookie actually being an intelligent person. That leads on to my next question nicely, which is he has some fun moments with uh, Mr. Presbaluske, which are kind of out of the ordinary for Dookie himself. I mean, was it nice to finally see him open up a little bit and have a little bit of a joke with people? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the shots with um, Jim True Frost, who played Mr. Presbo, those were some of the funnest scenes because in a lot of my other scenes, I was in a more, you know, just a, a pondering state. But when I was in the scenes with Mr. Presbo, it wasn't like a father-son relationship, but that's how I saw it when I was on the set because I had a very great understanding that Dookie's family wasn't there at all. So it was really just kind of like, this is my white dad, you know, this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so did, did he teach you any of the things? Because obviously in the classroom, he kind of teaches everybody how to gamble. But did he teach you further, you know, outside of actually being on on the set? He taught me a lot about acting. He taught me a lot about acting. Like, I really love the craft. Like, I'm, I'm really dedicated to the craft of acting in he he was he's just such a great actor. He was so committed. He was so effortless. He was just a person existing on camera and I really absorbed that from him and we really bounced off of each other well and there's actually this one moment that's kind of a blooper that made the show when I'm showing him how to basically buy all of these things for cheap and I'm like, You want me to show you how? And he kinda gives me this look and we start cracking up laughing and they kept it. And it was just we would have authentic moments like that. And, you know, that's what I took away, just the authenticity of the moment. I mean you were saying that obviously it was kind of it was an enjoyable and fun experience with Mr. Presbaluski, but I mean for Duque, season five is really, really hard and was it difficult to be that vulnerable throughout the entire season? Because it just seems like a really, really difficult acting job to be so down for all of those episodes. It was difficult. It was very difficult. It was like a battle zone sometimes because what people don't understand is like acting is trying to come as close to the real truth as possible. So come season two... You know, we had taken the break, the show had come out, and it's like, okay, that first thing, I get back in the chair, and, you know, I wasn't as dirty in the second season, <laughs> at least until the end, but it's just like, it was difficult. It was very difficult. It was very difficult, and there are times where I could just feel myself withdrawing from everybody on the set, because I'm still kind of feeling like Dookie, no pun intended, but... <laughs> <laughs> I felt myself just kind of withdrawing from people. It was, it was, there were some hard times, but that second season, Tristan and I, you know, in addition to finding out that we're actually cousins, we developed a really great friendship and he really helped me just be normal at times. <laughs> You're talking about your friendship with Tristan and, you know, Dookie and Michael. I mean, season five, episode nine, late editions comes up with one of the greatest speeches that one summer past, which completely breaks my heart every time I see it, because they're so far apart, Dookie and Michael, at that point. I mean, how difficult was it for you two? Because obviously, as you said, you were close friends. Was it difficult for you to do that scene? That scene was the... <laughs> that scene was the hardest scene ever. Because that was me and Tristan's last scene. I don't know if David and Nina planned it that way. Like, they were like, okay, we're going to make sure that y'all do y'all last scene. This is going to be y'all last scene. But it just hurt so bad because we knew this was the final season. And we, you know, we're family. We loved working with each other. And we knew that this would be our last time working together, at least for a while. But um, it was literally us saying goodbye to each other. It was literally a goodbye. So that's probably why I came across so authentic is because we were literally saying our goodbyes. And even the scene when we dropped Bug off, that was our last scene with Bug. So we, we literally shot that scene. Then the 
production, we moved over to the next part where we did our scene, and it was just like by the end of the night, you're just like, I'm spent, I'm over, I'm done, <laughs> I'm all cried out, I'm all, I'm done. We said goodbye to Bug, I said goodbye to Michael, we're done. How many times did you uh, film that scene then? We filmed it a lot. We filmed it a lot. Um, actually, we didn't film it a lot. There was the main shot right in front. There was the close-up on me. There was the close-up on Tristan. And we may have did it four, five, six times tops, but we didn't run it into the ground like we normally kind of do the other other scenes. But I think it's because we, not that we nailed it, but it was just so real. It was so real. It was so real. You could feel it. You could feel the tension even watching from the cameras, you could feel the tension. I mean, I, I watched the clip again just yesterday, and even then I started to think, I've got to switch this clip off because it's really getting to me. And that's just the two-minute clip. You know, it's it's out of context of the whole show, but I'm still feeling it. <laughs> but I, and then, obviously, at the end of you getting out of the car, it gets even worse because, oh. basically, Dookie is walking down the alleyway to become the new Bubbles, really. I mean, is that how you saw it as soon as you read that? At the time, no. At the time, no, because I really still didn't know who Bubbles was. I did from season four and season five, but it wasn't until two years ago when I had watched one through four in its entirety for the first time that I'm like, oh, so he is kind of like a Bubbles. And I even like how they ended it showing Bubbles get himself together because there's hopefully, you know, a chance for Dookie. The uh, season five, episode nine, late editions, written by George Pelicanos, who kind of always writes these second to last episodes and absolutely knocks it out of the park. Did him or David Simon give you any idea of the way the character was? No, nothing at all. Even Idris Elba, they always told us the story. I remember the first day we came to the production office, that's where we met Andre Royo. That's where we met Sonia Song. We were the new kids on the block. Remember, they had been filming and working together for years before we even come into the circle. So they were like, you know, when they killed Idris off, they just gave him the script and he found out that way. So we were all like, okay. You know, so you, you never knew what was going to happen until you got the script. You never knew you could die at the end of the, at the, end of the script and not have known. So... David Simon didn't prep us, and I remember we used to beg. We used to beg David Simon, Ed Burns, and Nina, like, okay, so what are we going to, uh, what's happening? Okay, so are we going to, and they'll just be like, if I told you, I have to kill you. Wow. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I'm fascinated with how David Simon works because he seems to keep it very close to his chest when giving interviews. So how was he with you? And obviously Nina Noble and Ed Burns and all of the writers, I mean, Richard Price and Dennis Lehane, how were they with you? They treated, in a really weird way, they kind of treated us all like their own. Like they, they really, they nurtured us like they were supportive when we needed support. I remember on um, season five, I had gotten bit in the face by my dog and left a scar under my eye. So they had to write a uh, write a scene where I got jumped on the corner to kind of prove where did the scar come from. But they were so understanding. But as far as David Simon is concerned, he is probably one of the most creative people I've ever worked with. Now that I understand what a creative is, he's really the most creative person I've worked with because the proof is in the pudding, first of all. And um, just the way you could tell that you were always in his little game. On the set, when you would ask questions, he would tell you what he wanted you to know. He would kind of walk away after saying something really profound to leave you there like, damn. You know, like David Simon, he's a really wonderful guy. He's just a, he's a wonder. He's a really wonderful guy. Wow. I mean, at what point did you think, you know what? I'm not in this 40 minute whodunit cop show. This is more than anything. When, when did you get that? Because obviously, as you said, you were still a young actor and you weren't really getting all the complexities that David Simon always throws in there. So when did you finally think this is so much more than cops and robbers? Two years ago, when I finally saw it for the first time, now I knew that the show was way more than Cops and Robbers. I knew that the show was amazing. But when I finally watched it from beginning to end, I was like, whoa, this is a masterpiece. 
And I was finding myself kind of saying to myself, like, damn, I wish I was in this show. And I was like, oh. (laughs) But it, it wasn't, you know, when you're in it, and especially when you're that young, you don't see it all. You're just kind of a part of it, and you're doing your part, and everybody's doing their part, and it comes out, and you watch it, and you're pleased. But then it takes a while sometimes to go back to it and be like, whoa, this is what we all did together. Wow, that's amazing. It took a while for me. So when the show had finished, and obviously you were still quite young, how long did it take you before you got, you know, your energy back? Because you said, you know, it was completely draining for you uh, for the final season because of everything you went through. So how long did it take you before you thought, I'm, I'm over it now. I'm back into the game, really? Truthfully, I would say about two years. About two years, maybe two to three, just coming back to just my bright, happy self all the time because I would just feel really withdrawn from people sometimes, you know, and I was just, I played Dookie for two years and technically three, if you include editing and airing and all of that, but it it took me almost just as long to kind of get out of it and snap out of it. It was, it was tough stuff, (laughs) tough stuff. Yeah. Uh, So when obviously it finished, what, what happened right at the end? I mean, did you all just say bye and that was it or? I remember we had a rap party. Yeah, we had, okay, yeah, that's what happened. We had this huge rap party at the production office, and Michael K. Williams and I had performed Michael Jackson's Thriller. Yeah. We performed Thriller. He was the Goblin, and I was Michael Jackson, and we killed it. We killed it. I mean, we killed it. Um, Hold on. Tristan had performed Kanye West Gold Digger with the women from Hair and Makeup. Me, because it's like you know, during the rap parties, everybody does something special, and you know, me and Michael did Thriller, and we nailed it. We nailed it. (laughs) So that was kind of the end that you finished with Thriller. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, we did finish with Thriller. But the real ending was the premiere. I guess that was the last time that we had all really saw each other. Um, It's probably the premiere because we always did two premieres. We would do one in New York and one in Baltimore, of course, because that's where we filmed. So it was like after that Baltimore premiere, I haven't seen a lot of people since. But, you know, even if it's Twitter or Instagram, we all keep in touch. <clears throat> As you said, you were close knit guys. You were even if you're on the phone, you kind of you feel like no time has passed. Right. But you were saying, you know, you've moved on to other things now. I've seen you pop up in TV shows and in films, and also I've seen that you're doing music as well. And looking at your music stuff, I've seen it described as sexy R and B. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, I guess <laughs> it's just funny. Because going from Dookie to sexy R&B, it's just like, are you kidding? What's going on here? But that was kind of in the beginning stages of my music when I was really trying to find out uh, what direction I wanted to go. And of course, it's still kind of an R&B sound. And of course, it's still kind of sexy. But um, I'm working really hard on my album. And it'll be out very soon. And I'm going to drop an EP even sooner. Very, very soon. So, um, you know, just... That's kind of got my attention and focus right now, but I, you know, hope to deliver like a really universal R&B sound, Uh, an R&B that everyone can appreciate, you know, you know, in honor of your ushers and so on and so forth. So was music always there? Because you said, you know, you were doing theater beforehand and everything, then you did The Wire and now you're back to music. So has music always been constant for you? Is that... Well, music was actually there first. I was introduced to acting by way of music because I was doing musical theater. So singing was how I got my start on the stage, honestly. But um, I kind of had to learn how to read those lines and get into those characters. And, you know, then I just started doing plays without the music. And then I landed the wire. So it was, it was all a journey that kind of started from music. Music was definitely there first. Do you see yourself doing like a, you know, a, a, a duo with like Tristan maybe or somebody like that, you know, putting out an EP together or something? Oh, yeah, we definitely talked about it. We definitely want to do it. We both really, really want to do it. It's just about right time, right song, right record, right placement. It's got to be perfect. If we are going to come together and do a song together, 
it kind of has to be as amazing as our work on the wire. We don't want to do anything that will kind of tank. But we definitely want to do it. It just hasn't happened yet. Maybe you can get like Michael K. Williams to do dancing in the video. I mean, he has to go back to dancing at some point. I mean, you look at those videos from the 90s and he absolutely killed it on those videos. Well, here's the thing. Like, I really want to incorporate my wire cast in my music career, even if it's just like a character in one of my music videos or just a cameo in my music video. Like, I believe that that's just... That's where I got my start. That's where it all started. And people are always going to remember that part of me. So I can't wait to incorporate things like that. And hopefully me and Michael can, you know, do a little, a little number in one of my videos or something. <laughs>